and 3, um, that what happened is that the Lord rested on the seventh day from all the work which he created and made. And then he blessed and sanctified the seventh day. That is, he instituted the Sabbath on that day because on that day he rested from all his works which he created and made. And I submit to you that, in my judgment, that's the very same principle upon which he picks and selects and shows us what the Sabbath day is to be now. And, and it is simply this. He enters into his rest from all his work, which he recreates. He does another whole work of creation. He does a new creation work. He comes down in the in, 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 incarnate. God the Son, Jehovah God incarnate, comes down and creates a new creation in the work of redemption. He does a new work of creation, the work of salvation and redemption accomplished. And he enters into his rest from that work on the first day of the week by his resurrection from the dead. He dies, is buried, he finishes the work, and he enters into his rest on the first day of the week. And then, 50 days later, he blesses and sanctifies, same language, blesses and sanctifies the first day of the week when he sends the Holy Spirit on the first day of the week upon his people on the day of Pentecost, and he blesses and sanctifies that very day upon which he entered into his rest from all his work which he recreates and made. And, and, and that is precisely the same principle by which he picked the seventh day in the first and original creation. So in the new creation, he selects the first day of the week by entering into his resurrection rest on that day and sending the Holy Spirit 50 days later to bless and sanctify that day, the first day of the week, which he in that way picks out and selects as the, the, the Sabbath for the new creation. Furthermore, the apostles recognized that selection because it being a day of rest and worship, they gathered on that day in Acts 27, on the first day of the week, verse, Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week when the disciples were come together to break bread. It was the day of worship. And they waited there in Troas a whole week so that the Sabbath came, the new creation Sabbath on Sunday, and they entered into the worship of God. Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul prescribes that day. He says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store. And he talks about the sacrifice of giving as, a, as an act of worship associated with the first day of the week. He says, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so you do the same. And they have a designation of that day, first day of the week, which is called in Revelation 1.10, the Lord's Day, which is the day that especially belongs to the Lord and is set out of all the days as his peculiar portion of time in the week or his Sabbath. So it's a day of rest, day of worship. And God has told us what day of the week is to replace the old creation Sabbath day, namely the first day of the week. So that is what I said in the break time about how to resolve that tension between the Sabbath being a moral law and the Ten Commandments and a sign of the Old Covenant on the seventh day. Okay? Now, we move on. The only feature that I have not mentioned is the final generation. I'm, just, I'm going to submit to you that we will, we will come to that when we look at the fulfillment of and when we look at the, um, the fellowship of the Old Covenant. Let's look at the fellowship of the Old Covenant, or the forms of divine service. There's a key text here, which is Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 and following. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 and following. In Hebrews 9, 1, we read, and Hebrews 8.13 says, he says a new covenant in that he has made the first old. So that ought to tell you that it lasts until the apostolic generation because it says, but that which is becoming old and waxes aged is nigh unto vanishing away. Hebrews 9, 1, etc. Many other passages which we'll see. Now even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service. And a sanctuary of this world. And there was a tabernacle and a candlestick and a holy place and etc. And, uh, and a priesthood and all of these things. That there was a manner in which the people of God were to have fellowship with God under the old covenant. And that was through the Levitical sacrificial system associated with the 
tabernacle. The Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle and eventually the temple, those are the ordinances of divine service associated with the fellowship. The fellowship of the Old Covenant. Hebrews 9, 1 to 10. And that fellowship of the Old Covenant by which they drew near to God has to do with the tabernacle, which is the place of God's special presence among them, and then the Levitical and Aaronic priesthood. And the whole system of feasts whereby they would meet with God three times a year in the place of his special presence, the whole sacrificial system, the whole drawing near to God that took place through the Aaronic Levitical priesthood. All of that has to do with the ordinances of divine service or that that which God instituted so that his people under the old covenant would have fellowship with himself. God established that. And there's much revelation concerning it in the book of Leviticus. Okay? And all of this religious service was intended to display to us God's dealing with his people. He speaks to them out of the tabernacle. And he defines for them how they are to relate to him. And this is the religious system of the Old Testament. And adherence to and fellowshipping with God in the light of this religious system or ordinances of service is part of being God's people under the old covenant. And all of this is contained in the book of the law which defines these ordinances of religious service. Now Hebrews chapter 7 is an important text in this regard. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7. Now, verse 11. If there was perfection through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, And that's referring to the whole set of ordinances that they receive. What further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be reckoned after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there must of necessity be a change of the law. There has to be a change in the book the book of the law, which defines the ordinances of divine service associated with the priesthood. So that you learn here, the final generation, Hebrews 7, 11, when there comes a change in the priesthood and a change in the law, there comes an end to the old covenant. And for example, there must of necessity be a change of the law. Then listen. For he of whom these things are said, that is Christ, belongs to another tribe, the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi, from which no man has given attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprung out of Judah, as to which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. You can read the book of Leviticus till you're blue in the face. You're not going to find anything in there about a priest from the tribe of Judah. The Judean priests. It's not in there. It's not in the law of the Old Covenant. It's not in the book of the law. The book of the law doesn't define the Judean priesthood. No such thing. Defines the Levitical priesthood. Defines the Levites and their special role. And it defines the Aaronic high priesthood. And all of the, how the priests come through Aaron's family and the tribe of Levi. The service of the Lord. It has nothing whatsoever to say in the book of the law. So if Jesus Christ is a priest and he doesn't come after the order of Aaron... He comes from the tribe of Judah. And Moses didn't write anything in the book of the law about that. If if the priesthood has changed, then there must of necessity be a change with regard to the book of the law that governs the fellowship of God between God and his people. There has to be. That's what the writer to Hebrews is very plainly and abundantly saying. So there was this manner of fellowshipping with God established in the Old Testament, and that now has been abundantly uh, changed. 
So this is the fellowship. There's a change in the priesthood. There's a change in the manner in which God fellowships with his people. That change is coming. Now, having looked at that, let's look at the fulfillment of the old covenant. We'll look at the fulfillment. we we'll look at the fellowship of the old covenant. Look at these different features. Still got more to say about the final generation, but let's look at the let's look at the fulfillment. This promise. This promise. How is this uh, promise of Exodus 19, 4 and 5? If you do this, then that. How is this promise fulfilled? What actually happens? Does it have a happy ending or does it have a sad ending? How does this end? Now, there are a certain class of Bible teachers that tell us that every single administration or dispensation of God's dealings with his people ends in failure. Well, at least concerning this Mosaic or Old Covenant, they're right. But with regard to the New Covenant, it's not right. Absolutely. In fact, you couldn't be more wrong than to say that the New Covenant ends in the same failure in which the Old Covenant ends. But first of all, let us acknowledge that this Old Covenant with the people of God does end in a failure. And it's a tragic failure. And observe how that failure is described. First in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 31. Concerning the pending judgment and the return from captivity that comes after that judgment. We read in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. In the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So. You have the fact that this new covenant will not last forever. I'm sorry, this old covenant will not last forever. The days are coming when the old covenant will come to an end and a new covenant will take place. And that will be a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And this is the covenant that he will make after those days, he says. The days are coming. It's in the future. Now observe, he says that he made the old covenant. When did he make the old covenant? He made it with the house of Israel and Judah. When did he make it? He made it when he took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, the wilderness generation. And that old covenant, which was established in the wilderness generation, has been perpetuated and it will continue until the generation and time. And here's the thing of the new covenant. It is perpetuated until the time of the new covenant. And at that time it ends. It's perpetuated until the time of the change in the priesthood. It's perpetuated until the time of the new covenant. And the new covenant and the change in the priesthood both occur at the same time in redemptive history, the same generation. And observe the outcome of this covenant. And why is the necessity of the new covenant? What for? Listen to what he says. But I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. This is going to be a different kind of covenant. It's going to be very distinct from that. Different promise. Which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. They broke it. All the day long, did I stretch forth my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people? The story of this sad, this sad story is already prophesied in, as I said, in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And it comes to pass. In the days of judges, periodically they broke and then were reformed. There was a period when they were largely obedient to that covenant in the days of David. And they experienced the blessing of David and Solomon. But then there was a continual decline and a a disobedience. First in Israel, a horrible decline, which came to its apex in the days of horrible, evil King Ahab and Jezebel and brought judgment upon the nation and captivity into Assyria. 
And then the house of Judah walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. And they did all kinds of horrible things. They sacrificed to the gods of the nations. Right in the very temple of the Lord. And right, they had images made to other gods right in God's temple. And provoked the Lord to wrath. And eventually he sent Nebuchadnezzar and carried them away to Babylon, captive and judgment, cast them out of the land. The remnant went down to Egypt because they wouldn't even live in the land. They were destroyed there in the land of Egypt. They wouldn't listen to, to Jeremiah who told them, stay in the land and they wouldn't listen. They went down to Egypt and there they were destroyed. Back to Egypt where they started. But then God in mercy brought a remnant back to the land and they rebuilt the temple and that was their history. It was a history of disobedience. And then finally, in the final generation of that covenant, when God fulfilled his promise and sent the son of Abraham, the son of David, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, what did they do? Did the vast majority of them receive him? No, they crucified him. And they said, and they turned him over to the Roman authorities, and their words were, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And they crucified the God the Son. They crucified their God incarnate. And in that act, which they could finally get their hands on Jehovah, they could finally get their hands on the one who redeemed them from Egypt, could finally get their hands on the one who spoke the Ten Commandments to them out of heaven, finally get their hands on the one who gave them the book of the law, they finally got their hands on God incarnate, and they murdered him. They killed the Son of God. And in that, they brought judgment upon themselves. They broke the covenant. They broke every one of those commandments so grievously and so violently when they murdered God incarnate. Which, my covenant, they broke. All the day long that I spread forth my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and in ears. And Jesus said to them that the blood of all the righteous that have been slain may come upon this generation. Now you read about this in the New Testament very plainly. We read in Matthew 21, Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Speaking about the the murder of God incarnate, the Son of God, and their rejection of them. The the Jewish leaders, and it's all coming to a head right here in Matthew 21. It's all coming to a head. Who do you say, what right do you say you're the Christ? Who do you say you are? What right do you have to say you're Christ? By what authority are you coming in here doing these things? Jesus said, I got a question for you guys. The baptism of John, where was it from? Heaven or men? They said, to themselves, we don't dare answer. They didn't dare. Because they said, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe him? When John the Baptist said, Jesus is the Christ. If we say from men, the people will stone us because everybody thinks John is a prophet sent from God. So they said, we don't know. Jesus said, well, I'm not going to tell you either then by what authority I do these things. Here are a couple of parables, gentlemen. He told them these parables upon that occasion. And the last parable they perceived that he spoke of them. Verse 45 says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived he spoke about them, and they sought to lay hold on him. They feared the multitude because everybody thought he was a prophet. But look what he said to them. He talked about them rejecting him. He said, verse 42, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same was the head of the corner. Verse 43, Therefore I say to you, the theocracy, the kingdom of God, shall be taken away from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. You will no longer be the people who are the people of God. In this ultimate act of rebellion against God, by murdering God incarnate, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and it will be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The theocracy will no longer be in Hebrew Israel. That promise that was made to you in Exodus 19 so long ago, now ultimately it's over. It's going to be taken away from you. You're not going to be a kingdom of priests. You're not going to be a holy nation. 
The kingdom of God, the, me- the messianic kingdom, is going to be taken away from Hebrew Israel and it's going to be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And what nation is that? It's that spiritual nation of Abraham's spiritual seed who are Jesus' children and Jesus' disciples. As, as we read in 1 Peter 2, that you are an elect race, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, a people for God's own possession, who were in time past no people, but now are the people of God. Furthermore, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, confirms the same. Speaking of the entire Old Covenant, using the designation the law, speaking of the Old Covenant, calling it the law in terms of its condition, which would have to do with its book and its tables, it's the book of the law, the tables of the law, we read this. What then was the law? What was the old covenant? It was added because of transgressions. And how long does it last? Until the seed should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was ordained by angels, uh, through angels, by the hand of a mediator. It, It was only intended to be temporary. The final is when the seed comes, which is Jesus. The seed of Abraham. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The final generation of the old covenant is the generation in which Jesus comes. It's the generation in which the new covenant is made. It's in that generation that the kingdom of God, the theocracy, the messianic kingdom is taken away from them and given to the nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. It's at that point that the law is changed. It's at that point that the priesthood is changed. The book of the law is changed. Hebrews 7, 11 and 12. Hebrews 8, 13. Hebrews 9, 10. When a new covenant is made with Israel, the old covenant comes to an end. And so the generation of Jesus and John is the the messianic generation is the final generation of the old covenant covenant even as that generation is the first generation the apostolic generation the first generation as we shall see of the new covenant and in that generation there is a transition from the old unto the new covenant and the new society of the people of God so then lastly what significance then does this covenant have in redemptive history What significance does it have in redemptive history? I have a five-fold significance of the old covenant in redemptive history. Okay. First of all, first of all, by this covenant, The entire Jewish society of the people of God derives its foundation. It is founded upon this. The law was added. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, 23, and 24, because of transgressions, was added as a foundation upon which the kingdom was built. Galatians 4, 3 and 4, Romans 3, 1 and 2, Romans 9, 4. The entire Jewish theocracy and society was founded upon this covenant. This covenant defined the very relationship between God and his people. Secondly, the people from whom the promised Savior from sin would come were separated from the world and preserved by the Lord. They were separated from the world and preserved by the Lord. Galatians 3.19 was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. Amos chapter 3 and verse 2. Leviticus chapter 18 verses 1 to 5. Leviticus 19.1 and 2. That God gave them ordinances and statutes to prevent them from sin, to preserve them as a nation to keep them. And that's what the book of Esther is about that, by the way, where there was a man named Mordecai who wanted to totally destroy the people of Messiah. And, uh, yeah, Haman, right, thanks. 
Mordecai was though I was thinking ahead of myself. And Mordecai says, Mordecai says to Esther, he says, if you all together at this time hold your peace, then will deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. It was not possible that Haman would destroy the people of the Jews. It couldn't happen because Messiah had not yet come. And God was committed. So God was committed to set that people apart, to protect and preserve that people until Messiah came. And Haman or anybody else couldn't destroy them. And that's what Mordecai saw and said. And so it was through the old covenant that the people of Messiah were separated from the world and protected. Thirdly, through the old covenant, in the very substance of the old covenant, the abiding testimony of God's will for human conduct in all times, the Decalogue, is declared before men. What is the Decalogue? It's the voice of conscience, codified, clarified, amplified, purified. It's the voice of conscience. That voice is codified. That voice is clarified. That voice is purified. That voice is amplified and, and, and shouted from Sinai in the Ten Commandments. Romans 3, 19 and 20 says, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And it says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be brought under the judgment of God for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Romans 7, 7 to 12. The abiding, the abiding will of God for all men everywhere are declared in the Old Covenant, the abiding testimony. Fourth, fourth, there are many, many graphic pictures of the person and work of Christ are displayed. Luke 24, 26, and 27, and 44 to 47, where he opened up all things in the Old Testament that are concerning himself. He's pictured in many ways. He's pictured in the Day of Atonement. He's, he's pictured as the priest and both of the goats. His person and work are pictured there with respect to the Day of Atonement. And in many, many other ways, the person and work of Christ are displayed to us. And fifth and finally, we learn many spiritual lessons. We receive many needful admonitions and lessons concerning holy living. Many such things are given to us in the Old Covenant. 1 Corinthians 9, 9 and 10, and 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Even in the civil and ceremonial statutes, we learn things about principles. We see pictures and learn principles. For example, Paul says, you shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the corn. He says that applies. There's There's an ethical, moral principle of justice that you learn from that old civil statute. And it is that when a man preaches the gospel, he should live with the gospel. So you take the general equity, as our confession says, of those civil statutes, and you learn to apply them to our own specific circumstances and context. It's not that we're under the, the whole body of the book of the law as a body politic to be obeyed, because you can't do that outside the land of Canaan. But that you take the civil statute that says, you shall not muzzle the ox when it treads out the corn, and you take the principle that's there, and you learn how to apply it to life. As a general principle of righteousness and equity, Paul says, if a man lives with the God, or preaches the gospel, he should live with the gospel because you don't muzzle the ox when he treads out the corn. That's how Paul used it. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, These things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come, so that we wouldn't lust like they also lusted. There are object lessons about morality. Um, There are object lessons about how to live, object lessons about experience that are given from the Old Testament, and a lot of it is negative examples of how not to live. And that's why, you know, preaching that way does not make us guilty of moralisms, because that's what Paul did in 1 Corinthians 10. He said, these things were written for your admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages are come. You're supposed to learn from these things. Now, that doesn't mean we should go back and preach the Old Testament as though we were rabbis, as though the sermon could just as easily have been uh, given in a synagogue as in a Christian church. But nevertheless, we don't throw it out as though it has nothing to do with us because it was written for our admonition, that we would learn from it, that we wouldn't fall into the same things that they fell into. We're supposed to learn from their mistakes and not learn the hard way like they did in the school of hard knocks. 
So it has much benefit to us. Furthermore, and I just want to say this about it, the law was inferior, yes. It was good. It doesn't say it was evil. It says that we have a new covenant and that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant which is based on better promises. The promise, if you obey my voice, then you will be to me. I mean, I've heard people say things like, they should have rejected this. The Jews made a big mistake, you know. They should never have agreed to that. So, you guys, people say that. So you've got to be kidding me. You hear the voice of God come down out of heaven and utter the voice of conscience openly to you. You say, nah, I don't think so. You've got to be kidding me. We, we want a better deal. You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding, right? People seriously posit the idea that Jews should have rejected that as though it was evil. It was a wonderful privilege that God gave them. It was good. It was not a republication of some scheme of salvation by works that people suppose existed. That's just not true. In fact, let me, say, let me put it bluntly. I didn't get into lecturing on this, but even before the fall, we would not have been saved on the basis of our own works. It was the work of Adam that determined the standing of his posterity. So if you want to call it a covenant of works, then the person whose works you've got to talk about is the works of Adam. Just like it's the work of Christ. It was the work of Adam in his evil deed of eating from the tree that was imputed to us. And by way of implication, if he had obeyed it, his obedience would have been imputed to us. It was never to do with our own works anyway. It had to do with his work. You follow what I'm saying? And so this is not a republication of that because that never even was. But they were supposed to do this out of love. They're supposed to do this out of grace. They were supposed to understand that what's on the conscience, God God screams it from Sinai. And they were supposed to do that out of love to the God who had reached down into the pit, redeemed them out of Egypt, freely given them inheritance, freely you received. They should have said, thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because we love you, how can we please you? Keep the Ten Commandments. That's what conscience says anyway. We won't lie. We won't steal. We won't commit adultery. We we won't disobey the constituted authority. We'll keep your holy day because we want to be with you. That's not a way to earn your way to heaven. But what they ought to have been doing was doing that out of love and gratitude for the redemption they had received. That was good. It wasn't evil. But it's if you take that and you impose that on wicked hearts... What it stirs up in wicked men is just hatred, animosity, and disobedience because of the hearts of men. Because they don't have grace in their hearts. And if you don't have grace in your heart, you don't want to please God, no matter what God does for you, because you're not grateful. You're an ungrateful person. Unthankful and evil. And that's exactly what they were. In spite of the fact that they saw the miracles, they disobeyed God because they didn't have grace in their hearts. But if those of, those of them that had grace in their hearts weren't earning their way to heaven, but they were trusting in, 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 in the work of God, an atoning work that was promised as far along as Genesis 3.15, and they were serving God out of love and gratitude for all that God had done for them in redeeming them and giving them an inheritance freely that they never merited or earned. So it was good, but it was inferior and temporary. And we have something better than that. And why do we have something better? Because the new covenant doesn't say, if you keep the commandments, if you keep the Ten Commandments, then I'll make you my special people and a kingdom of priests. It doesn't say that. It says, here is my covenant I'll make after those days. I will write the Ten Commandments, my law, on your heart. And I will put my fear in your hearts that you will not depart from me. So there's no if. And God himself is committed to see to it that out of gospel obedience, out of love to God, we keep his holy law by grace because of the grace that's going to be worked in us in writing the law on our hearts. Now, if then is good, but I will put my Ten Commandments in your heart is better. And we have a better covenant based on better promises now that's the other thing in terms of this fulfillment you see there's a there's a continuity there's a connection between the old and the new 
There's not a total discontinuity, but there's a continuity between the old and the new. In the old, the Ten Commandments, God says, he puts them on tables of stone. He says, if, then, you'll have a special place forever as my people. You'll be kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When the Messiah comes as royal priests, you'll be his children, and you'll be priests, and you'll be royal priests, and you'll be that holy nation forever. If you walk in gospel obedience to my voice. But now, what happens? He says, I give you this book. So that you do this book in the land that I'm going to give you to possess. I give you the book to do the book in the land. You go in the land, you do the book. And now that's done. That old covenant is done. And the book of the law is no longer binding on us Gentiles. How can it be? We don't live in the land of Canaan. How are we supposed to keep the year of Jubilee? How do you keep the year of Jubilee in South Carolina? How do you do that? Explain that to me. Explain to me how it's possible to keep the year of Jubilee in South Carolina. You can't do it. The only way you can do the year of Jubilee in South Carolina is if you have genealogical records that take you back all the way to the original possession that you had in Canaan, and then everybody goes back to where he lived. It's not possible to keep that part of the, of the law in South Carolina. It's just not even possible. You can only keep it in the land of Canaan. And first you have to receive that land by lot from God as an inheritance and everybody has to know his family genealogy and where he lives so that he can go back there every 50 years and it, their land can revert to the original families every 50 years. How in the world are you going to do that if you don't live there? It's the land of the law and the law of the land. So that book, that book as an entire body is no longer binding on us as Gentile Christians, it's no longer binding on us as Christian Israel. It's no longer. The whole book and everything in it is set aside as a body politic. It's not the constitution of the Christian church of Christian Israel. It's not anymore. It's gone. All of it. The whole book. Because there's a change in the priesthood and there must be a change in the law, a change in the book that defines the priesthood and all the statutes and ordinances that they were to do in the land. We have a new inheritance. It's not the land of Canaan. Okay? So the book is set aside. But what do we learn from the book? Then just rip the book up? No. Because in that book it says, you shall not muzzle the ox when trestles out the corn. You take that book and you read it. And in the ceremonies like Leviticus 16, you see lessons about Christ. Fulfilled in Christ. And in the statutes, like you shall not muzzle the ox who treads out the corn, you learn moral principles that you take and apply to ecclesiastical life, civil life, family life, every kind of life. You take the general principles of equity or righteousness and you apply them. And you take the pictures and ceremonies and you see in them Christ and his person and work. And you believe and trust in the Christ who's pictured therein. And that's how the book applies to us. But what about the tables? How does that apply to us? The time of the fulfillment, what was written on the tables of stone, he says, I will write on their hearts. And God comes by the Holy Spirit in regenerating grace and writes on our hearts a love to the, the law and the Ten Commandments. So we say, oh, how I delight in your law. It's my meditation all day. I love the law. I love the commandments. I want to do your will, oh my God. I want to obey God. Why do I want to obey God? Why do I like to obey God? Why do I delight in it? Why is it not grievous to me? Because God has put upon our hearts that we want to. He's changed our heart. He changed our hearts. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. And that's why those that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. And Christ died in order that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 3 and 4. So that the Holy Spirit comes and writes it on our hearts and sees to it that we in evangelical gospel obedience do it because he puts it on our hearts. He works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. We want to keep his Ten Commandments because he makes us want to. We work or strive or try to keep his Ten Commandments because he makes us try to. He works in us to will. He works in us to strive, to work, in order to please him. And then he enables us with evangelical, sincere gospel obedience to do it so that we actually do please him. And he keeps us and preserves us in a way. And that's how the Ten Commandments applies to us in the New Covenant. So the book 
is set aside, abrogated as a body politic for the people of God under the new covenant. And the tables are inscribed on the heart. So that what we now obtain from the book is the general principles and the pictures. And what we get in the tables is that God by his finger writes it on our hearts and enables us by the spirit to do it. That's the outcome. That's how it's fulfilled. And that's its application to the people of God under the new covenant. You with that? You follow that? Good. Okay. I'm done. Five minute break. And then we come back and the last thing we do tonight is Davidic.